be one of the most difficult parts of mechanics is when it gets applied to relativity or hydrodynamics or we are just talking about plasma physics. And that involves the tensor analysis and the uh, use of these funny little, some people call them the Christoffel uh, symbols. We try to make them a little bit more friendly by showing that they're basically the Coriolis centrifugal uh, whatever uh, involves curling your coordinate uh, forces, or fictitious forces. So we'll spend a good half of the lecture going over the analysis that uh, goes with the sensor analysis. Then I want to go ahead and come back to the spherical coordinates and uh, look at um, the uh, couple of uh, concepts that we've already talked a little bit about, but now we're going to uh, take it a little further. Um, the uh, object of the day uh, is uh, something called the eyeball. You've heard of iMac and iNet, but here is the eyeball, and um, we're going to do uh, a problem that involves the calculation of the kind of frequencies and behavior uh, when you have a sphere with a single mass. This one has seven uh, that are running around each other. And we'll look at a video slow motion of that uh, a little bit later. Uh, some of the uh, feedback uh, that I asked you to write up, some of the people on there said they like to have um, a problem shown in some detail that would be immediately helpful for a problem that actually occurs on the homework. So uh, this is an example of that. Uh, uh, actually, I already started it in the last homework set. Uh, I think the cycloid had a little bit of a start for you. So we'll try to do that uh, from now on. <clears throat> and uh, the use of effective potentials is the main part of most of the mechanics that you find if you just pick up random uh, classical mechanics book. So um, we'll get to about here where we have the movie of this thing and an analysis of that. So you can look at the uh, problem that we're going to do, which will be, uh, instead of being confined to the sphere, it'll be confined to a cone. Uh, this is the thing that confines a radius. Well, that will confine the uh, polar angle use that as a parameter rather than as a variable. So the, these are um, important uh, considerations. Uh, and let me get this one playing here. And uh, there's some extra uh, links here uh, that uh, TC has put in. And, um, we're going to uh, keep, always have a second page that has stuff that we've talked about before. In any case, uh, let's get started on uh, all of these screens here with the uh, basic idea that we have to uh, work with when we do these uh, funny coordinates. And you have some funny symbolism that goes with it. Um, we're used to, I think, already, if you've taken a course with books like Jackson, that a partial derivative of something with a coordinate i would just be comma i. Well, this is semicolon here uh, to distinguish uh, the, what we're talking about here from that um, usual common notation. And um, we need to uh, understand these uh, coefficients by the definition that I'm going to give you right now. But as you can see, there are, um, if we're doing Cartesian fixed coordinates of, or uh, fixed coordinates of any kind, ones that uh, are straight lines, no curves. Um, we would just be interested in how the components were changing. But as I've already pointed out many times, uh, the generalized coordinates uh, have a problem with, the, say, the tangent vectors, the tangent space, being on a curve. And so not having a zero partial derivative with respect to any of the coordinates often. So, we get two terms when you take a partial derivative of a vector. And it's handling those two terms, particularly this one, that involves these uh, Christoffel coefficients. 
So let's go ahead uh, and just define the first kind of these uh, coefficients. Uh, there's two kinds, and it could be worse. Uh, and there could be uh, more and more kinds, but two is all you have. And that's basically associated with covariant and contravariant, but it is not, isn't quite that simple. The first kind here is just basically a covariant derivative, a, a covariant vector dotted with the partial uh, derivative of the uh, unitary vector is the correct terminology for the, the classical thing. So I'm looking here at an index i n and then semicolon is associated with the vector that's being dotted here. And uh, the uh, interesting thing about this is that the partial derivative uh, of E n with respect to i is the same as the partial derivative with the n here and the i there. So these first two indices can be switched. Uh, they're always symmetric uh, in um, the uh, thing. And this is going to be the same thing uh, is true for this thing of the second kind where we use the contravariant vector in the dot product. And that means that the Christoffel coefficient uh, goes up into the uh, contrary thing to match uh, this one. So um, <clears throat> let's get uh, it on both of these screens here and on the uh, one down here. So um, the reason for that symmetry uh, is uh, fairly obvious here. Um, first of all, <clears throat> and this is the really important symmetry, the partial derivative of the vector n with respect to i, coordinate i, turns out to be the same as the flip the i and n uh, derivative right here, and that's because of this uh, ability to switch the partial derivatives. And um, another way to uh, uh, state this uh, contravariant second kind is that you use a raising metric on the first kind, and uh, you will, you know, make a make a proper transformation of, of those two. So you get this stuff uh, up here, and um, so th those are the basic definitions of the uh, first and second kinds of these uh, weird Christoffel coefficients that we have to get used to here. So. Uh, the thing that, as I say, it could have been worse. You could have a necessity for uh, three uh, objects, and uh, fortunately, we don't have to do that. And uh, the reason for that is, is going to be quite evident here. And, and um, the, you might say that if I'm going to. Uh, work with contravariant vectors, taking derivatives of those. Here we've been taking derivative of the uh, covariant vector. If I'm going to work with contravariant vectors and take their derivatives, uh, shouldn't I uh, have a completely different uh, set of coefficients and use some other Greek letter uh, to indicate them? And uh, it's good news on a pile of bad news that uh, this lambda coefficient is just a gamma coefficient uh, with a minus sign. And that, that you uh, can prove by uh, writing the partial derivative of the delta function that we'll get when we take a scalar product of a contra with a co. Um, that, that particular derivative is definitely zero. Certainly zero when m and n isn't, uh, they aren't equal, but it is also true if you put a one there. Uh, take that derivative with respect to coordinate, that's zero, identically. So we end up here with this plus this having to be zero. So that means that this lambda guy right here is just a minus of the one that we uh, defined up here. So that's what you have to do whenever you work with a derivative that involves a contravariant. A minus appears in the definition of the derivative of the um, now, um, <coughs> that crystal coefficient, of course, 
this thing right here, here is, uh, <coughs> in front of the, uh, or is summed over uh, the components. And that's going to take care of all the Coriolis uh, of business. Okay, um, let's get all this on the proper screen here. Okay, so any any questions about about that? That's uh, one um, important piece of um, the calculus of, of uh, tensor analysis. I've got a question. Yes. It, maybe it's not that important, but what is there a significance for why you pick one is the first kind, one is the second time? Is that arbitrary, or they have some specific like, purpose? That's a good question because. Um, I have never seen anybody call this one the first kind and that the second kind. So I'm basically just following the leader. Because I would think, I would call would, the second would, kind the first time because you, like that one you keep the E sub in on yeah. both of them, right? Because you wrote the derivative. But isn't it so nice to have your indices all in a line, <laughs> right? It <laughs> is. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, this is Riemann did this, right? Yeah. I mean, we're going way back. So um, it's hard to say. I, I just remember that the first kind, you don't have to have two layers, mm -hmm. two levels of index. Um, so these are the weirdos. <laughs> right? yeah. These are more common. But you're absolutely right in this kind of designation. And just imagine if we'd had to have a third and fourth, right? Yeah. Uh, we lucked out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, if you talk about coordinate, uh, coordinates that uh, don't meet, that is anti-symmetric uh, crystallic coefficients, and this is stuff that comes up with string theory. I mean, if you want to go crazy in uh, uh, unitary, this kind of unitary calculus, you can do it. Um, it doesn't yield anything so far, but uh, there are um, discussions of that situation. Now, um, the, the semicolon notation. I mean, that's just part of the game here. So, uh, I, I, you know, want to keep that, um, you know, up, up, up front here. And let's see if I've got um, anything else here that I need to uh, show. I think that's... Um, but we're... That sort of sums up the definitions of these things. And the way we write... Um, something called the covariant derivative. Okay, so this is the, the main topic. We would like to have a derivative that we designate just by writing the component of the vector. It could be contravariant or it could be covariant. Writing uh, those two derivatives as semicolon. The semicolon notation indicates I've got to do more than this. That's the, the, if I just put a comma here, or here, and, and um, if, if I just have that, uh, then I'm back in Jackson working with uh, coordinates that are orthogonal coordinates, and, and uh, well, mostly not even curving coordinates, and I just have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, partial derivative of the vector with respect to qi. This sign with a plus sign because of the definition uh, here, or a minus sign here uh, when you're talking about the derivative of a covariant component, which we, is, is married to a contravariant vector, then I need the minus sign that popped up right there. Okay, so third and fourth kind, <laughs> if there were one. Uh, would have uh, more complicated things than that. Here we just have an extra minus sign. Anyway, this is supposed to take care of all of the curving that's going on uh, as a result. So when we take a covariant uh, derivative of thing, we're taking a derivative that, uh, uh, on board whatever it is that's following the curvilinear coordinates. So you're, you're in a non-inertial frame uh, even without having uh, anything but um, uh, three dimensions in space. If you've got time going, well, then you're going to play the same game. All of this is going to be uh, valid for four-dimensional space-time. 
All right. Well, uh, this is mathematicians being cooed. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but um, it's uh, it, 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 in some ways it's annoying, but uh, uh, it's part of the literature. So when you go to read uh, the literature, uh, let's go back to the cute stuff here. Um, <clears throat> you will see uh, a derivative del of a vector component. And what that is, is with a minus sign if it's a covariant vector with a, a component, a contravariant component has the usual plus sign, first kind. And um, the idea being that here's the partial derivative, and now I'm actually uh, thinking about a velocity, uh, say, uh, that's uh, the way I would uh, 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 write it. I'd be taking a derivative of something uh, done. So I would be writing that uh, funny semicolon here for that component. Uh, in a sense, this cuteness is uh, a little bit overdone because this sort of covers up all of the stuff that you have to sum up in order to get this. And then, isn't it wonderful, Newton's law, Newton 2, is, is true here for space-time, curve space-time. So you're doing the worst you can do in general relativity. You still write F is this weird delta derivative with respect to time. It's just shorthand. It's, it's um, you know, being cute. Okay, making things uh, compact. Saving chalk, I guess. And, we don't have any chalk here to save, but um, that is the idea of the intrinsic derivative. Okay, covariant versus contravariant once again, plus sign, minus sign. Okay, um, the actual formula for these uh, things, this is really uh, one of the more annoying parts of this uh, technology, and one that I would like to show today how you avoid this. But nevertheless, um, if you study this, that's, this is the first task, is to actually give a formula for these Christoffel coefficients in terms of the metric, the g mu nu, the g i j, okay? Well, uh, this first of all, the symmetry that we came from the partial order being okay. Uh, that symmetry makes it possible to rewrite this and this, of course, this scalar product is a metric coefficient, a covariant one in this case. And so I just go through, and if I switch from what I get here, that's the definition of the Christoffel first kinds, and uh, I uh, just switch I within, and I get this. I see the little arrows indicating I'm switching. And I switch I with M, I get this. Okay, so we look at those and see if we can get them to cancel uh, 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 say, subtract one of them from others and get an actual formula uh, for our uh, Christoffel coefficients. That's these things. So um, doing that uh, isn't trivial. Um, let's get these guys all uh, lined up here. And also, um, I'd like to put a minus sign out so I can actually cancel the thing, and that's what's going to give us a formula if I do that. So this is the deal, is to go ahead now with this formula and notice that this cancels that and this cancels that. And I just left with these two guys here, which are the same. So uh, I sum this thing up and take a half of all of this. Bingo, I've got a what looks like a compact and useful formula uh, for the uh, Christoffel coefficient of the first kind and then use the metric again to get the second kind. So, big deal. But, you see, you've got a problem here. If I'm talking about just three-dimensional space, this is third ring. I've got three times three times three. That's 27 of these suckers I've got to work out. Okay, how can we avoid that? That's, that's in cutting some light. And if it's four times four times four, you know, you've got a lot of uh, uh, work here. Well, you could say that's what computers are for, but still, we'd like to make it job easier for the computers because it has to do that calculation a, a million times uh, just to get one step of some differential equation solved. Uh, you're saving some time by doing something about this problem. 
But um, the uh, let's see if there's anything I need to say. Um, what I, I'm going to do now is go on to discuss. Is this a tensor? Actually, does this t transform like a tensor? And the answer is absolutely not. And uh, we, we'll see why that is. That that is really a a key thing uh, to uh, understand about this. Now, um, <clears throat> when we um, think of a transformation, we think of a transformation, say, from the metric uh, coefficients that work in a coordinate system that you've used to set up a problem, but then you're going to try to find some other set of coordinates. This is almost the way physics always works. Some find another set of coordinates uh, that works to describe the solution to a, a differential equation. And so we'll call that coordinate system the barred coordinate system, and we'll put bars over everything that's associated uh, with the completely different curvilinear coordinate system to the one that's being used here without the bars. So the question is then, what would this thing be with bars on it? Or um, would it be as simple as uh, the um, sensors that we get that come just from uh, products of E vectors like this or uh, partial derivatives that are the transformation coefficients uh, for those uh, vectors. So remember the chainsaw uh, rule for getting a transformation, changing this guy here, this Jacobian matrix, uh, changing it uh, so that it uh, gives you uh, the barred Jacobian in terms of the original uh, one. In other words, I just stick in here a sum over m, distinct from m bar now, and uh, a sum over n, uh, distinct from n bar. I go ahead and do that, and let's get it on all, all the screens here. Uh, this is the uh, nasty part of uh, this particular um, set here, where we look look at this, uh, you know, these Christoffel coefficients as something that are curing the curvature problem for uh, tensors, but they themselves. Uh, don't behave like tensors. So here is just showing you a second rank covariant uh, tensor of some weird kind that you're going for, given in, given in terms of the one that you've already set up, and the Jacobian that, that, that transforms you. Uh, and you, second rank, so you use two Jacobians uh, to turn the metric into uh, something that works in this new barred uh, system. Okay, so uh, we do this for everything uh, that we uh, have here. This being the actual transformation of a second rank tensor, covariant, contravariant components defined this way. Uh, and we'd like to get it uh, in terms of the covariant, uh, contravariant components in the original. Uh, coordinate system, the unbarred uh, coordinate system. Now, the um, question is, when, when you're dealing with this, what, what, what is... Now, this is a, the original s statement for the partial derivative of u in terms of the Christoffel coefficients. So, um, this part and this part have to transform so as to make this uh, thing behave uh, like it is two Jacobians, one with upstairs and one with downstairs for the bars, countering, uh, of course, uh, the one here that's upstairs against the downstairs on the component. Now, just to remind you, all of this stuff, these transformations, are supposed to be looking at some piece of physics from different points of view, some different reference frames. Okay, so the actual thing, usually written in bold face the way we do it here, uh, the actual thing is not changing. It's the uh, viewpoint of it that's changing. So keep that in mind. Now, uh, go ahead and look at how a uh, covariant-contravariant component works here. We do the same old chainsaw 
uh, summing there, and this gives us an expression for this thing in terms of that thing, and there's a Jacobian. That, that's pretty much all there is to uh, doing a transformation, no matter how complicated. So I can go ahead and do that with all of the stuff uh, that we have looked at here so far, all the second rank uh, stuff. Okay, so just to use seesaw, ch chainsaw <laughs> sums, like our Arkansas <laughs> way of expressing um, higher mathematics. But um, in this case, we're looking at co a contravariant uh, transformation. So my chainsaw sum has to reflect that, and there's the, the transformation for that. And analogously, the other uh, one. Now, um, see if I've got something here. I, I, I go ahead and turn this thing around a little bit. Um, this guy comes in. Uh, that's what you get when you have the covariant. So compare this uh, to that. And I'll go ahead and put that one on the green, which is the uh, covariant E transformation. So this, this is uh, what is going on now, is that we know now that these components here, these things are going to either uh, do the dual covariant contravariant transform, or this one's going to do the covariant covariant uh, transform of those components. And this thing uh, right here, of course, canceling the, the canceling the, the um, up versus down uh, to make the object that we're doing, which is the partial derivative of a vector that is invariant to a uh, choice of, of coordinates. Okay, so second rank tensors uh, and components that are made uh, out of uh, uh, second rank uh, sensors uh, have that nice Jacobian or Kajobian. That now it doesn't make any difference. It's like back to your what, what's uh, the first kind, what's the second kind, what are you going to call up, what are you going to call down, right? It, uh, when you both curl in here, uh, you might as well lose that old Jacobian uh, uh, knowledge. But the transformation of just a partial derivative, that's a comma here instead of a semicolon, not so simple. At first it looks pretty good. And let's get it on the uh, other screen here as well. There's the thing. At first it looks pretty good, but then you realize, oh my gosh, that darn vector is a curvilinear vector, so uh, we have to do uh, the full uh, thing. <clears throat> if that second term there, the partial derivative of the Jacobian between the unbarred curves and the barred curvilinears, if that isn't constant, and that means pretty much that it's just straight lines, uh, if that isn't true, if that isn't zero, then th th this, this extra term is needed. Okay. And um, that then uh, means that these uh, Christoffel co uh, coefficients don't have a simple ten tensor transformation. Their job is to make it simple for the things that you're actually using. So the bottom line of this discussion here, this rather um, difficult way of looking at some of these things, but uh, I thought you ought to see it anyway. Um, this, this guy right here with a partial just a comma, not a semicolon. It needs the Christoffel correction to be right. And this, this, uh, <clears throat> this uh, Christoffel guy right here cannot be a, 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 a second rank, a, a true second rank tensor that has simple Jacobian transformation properties. So, that, with that warning, let's go on here and actually look. Uh, first of all, at some examples that involve the um, cylindrical coordinates. That's the example we use. But I also want to, now that we've done this, I want to get the last uh, very complicated uh, way of describing F equal M A. And uh, we've pointed at this thing a couple of times already, but the uh, Riemann equations of, of motion the way you say F equal MA and 
in um, general relativity or in any uh, crazy coordinate system. Um, and even one where I'm summing over Cartesian coefficients of a mass or some, some kind of inertia matrix, uh, I want to uh, be able to write a kinetic energy that in the Cartesian coordinates and transform it to a fully GCC uh, of coordinates. Now it turns out, in order to do that, in order to do that, I have to make some very explicit uh, definitions here. And I must, uh, to use this, I have to say that uh, these explicit dependencies with respect to time cannot be uh, in, uh, in these coordinates. So that means that one of the coordinates has to be time. So you have to increase the dimension by one in order to play with this uh, Riemann stuff in, in relativity. And that's for special relativity as well. So, um, as I say, remember how the gamma replaces G by summing over masses. And you get a, a different G for each mass in general. Okay. So time must be included as a dimension to play this particular game uh, that we're uh, talking about here. Okay, and that is the one that's going to give us the force equation. Now, that's kind of going along with what I had said before, and that is that this Lagrange uh, uh, equation uh, that has the force on the outside, we haven't set this thing equal to a potential yet. Uh, this, as I call it, the four-wheel drive garbage truck can take a load of crap and go anywhere, uh, even into uh, uh, time to explicit time-dependent coordinates. You can still use this thing. Okay, we're, we're leaving that behind, but we're picking up the elegance of the Riemann equation that's going to come out of working with a, mo a, a general metric that will be, in general, uh, for just one particle, four-dimensional, and for two particles, eight-dimensional, and so forth. So uh, that is what this is all about here, is getting to that uh, point in our uh, discussion. Okay. So we're going to have, uh, once again, a relationship that involves converting velocities to momenta. And this gamma is going to do it just like it, it did before. So we'll get to use all of that um, covariant, contravariant stuff, but now we have to make the stipulation that we include time as a dimension now if we're going to do um, relativity. Okay, uh, so this sort of sums it up here. What, we're, what we have as far as an equation of motion. Okay? Lagrange force equation, as I said before, we really got garbage truck. What well, you really go to when you're stuck with some weird moving coordinate system? Well, we're, we're going to make the time be a coordinate and uh, then proceed using the fancy tensor stuff. Okay, so here, here are a couple of steps, just a couple of steps to get a, a Riemann equation of motion involving a, in this case, a, fo a, a covariant force component. Well, the derivative of this thing involves uh, two terms when we collect a, a couple of them uh, um, fairly easily. I'm taking a derivative here that involves the derivative with respect to time of the gamma L, so we do have to have that, but we also have a derivative with respect to time of Q dot that makes Q double dot. And then uh, we have already built into the thing by the, the actual uh, Lagrange equation, we've got a minus the partial derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to coordinates, so we ought to take that uh, into account. And uh, let's see if there's anything else. Yeah, that, that one gets a, 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 a half. Minus a half. Well, it looks like we've got a bigger mess than we started with. If I can replace that with something, that might help. And indeed, that's what does help. And let's get this 
up on the uh, other screen here, along with what we're really headed at, using the Christoffel formula right now just to make this work. The idea being, and this is really where we're headed, is uh, we don't need that formula. And that I want to demonstrate with an explicit example uh, very shortly here. But uh, the covariant Riemann equation, might as well get that on the other screen. There's a contravariant one too, but that's easily obtained once we get this one. So the basic idea is I look at my derivatives of the gamma metric, the kinetic, the dynamic metric, and then use the formula for each of the uh, coordinate metrics that go into making the gamma uh, sort of occurring right here. So I get a formula that looks like the one that we wrote for G, but it's all linear, so I can just uh, replace that thing right there with um, a Christoffel coefficient, which I, I do not change the notation for the Christoffel. Uh, I, I could make it crinkly or something, but this guy right here is taking account of all of the metric coefficients uh, that are in uh, a formula like that. So there's your new equation. That's the most complicated way in the, I can think of to give f equal ma. There's f, here's ma. <laughs> but in the crazy coordinates that we will work with, if we could do anything curvy. Now, what's going to happen is that we're just going to go back to the old garbage truck here and work that out and then read off the Christoffel coefficients. The ones that are zero out of the, say, 27 or however many that, that uh, you would normally have to crank through and this be surprised by a zero and go on to the next one, automatically show up. So this really puts down on labor to realize that this thing, even in four-dimensional space-time, is a good way uh, to uh, get equations of motion for what they call the geodesic and all of that kind of stuff. So. Uh, there's the contravariant one right there, and uh, I'm putting it on the left-hand side there. That's easy to obtain if I go through and multiply by the gamma that's the inverse of the gamma covariant. I multiply by the contravariant one. I get a contravariant vector for the force, and I get a very simple expression here with the double derivative of the coordinate exposed. Now, if you're doing it by computer, then could be useful. Get that thing on the left-hand side of the equation and the other stuff on the right hand, that may be the quickest way uh, to solve a mechanics problem, whether it's relativity or not. So these are all uh, things that I'm you know, taking some time to point out. Um, when it comes time for you to use these things, I recommend reading the chapter in the, in the text in Unit 3. This is the main uh, think about three. But let's take an example. Let's get the cylindrical uh, coordinates and then a problem we given uh, this week for you to do spherical. But uh, we'll do the uh, uh, cylindrical ones and we've already seen the answers to the Coriolis coefficients. Well, they're going to be the Christoffel coefficients. Exactly. And we'll look at that problem with the vortex real quick uh, before we uh, go on. I think I have a video to go with that that's uh, rather nice. Anyway, here are the uh, cylindrical coordinates and their Jacobian. And this presumably you've already uh, worked this out for a problem. Well, spherical coordinates have one too. You should probably have, have gotten that as well uh, by now. But um, let's just do cylindrical. So there uh, are the force relations for uh, radius, azimuthal angle, and Cartesian z co a coordinate. That's trivial. It's just equal to little fz for the curvilinears. No difference there. But for the uh, x and the y, it's a, it's a mix-up of the radius and the uh, polar angle uh, phi. Okay, and there's a picture of, of the uh, force vector written. Uh, in terms of covariant vectors and contravariant vectors and Cartesian and curvilinear and all that. So this is an orthogonal system, so a metric is diagonal. That makes things a lot easier. But um, the uh, kinetic metric 
the one that involves the mass, uh, is uh, that guy uh, right there. And we've looked at that uh, before as well. So these are uh, what we'll be uh, using uh, to get, um, first of all, using the metric. Metric is very simple. But the inverse metric, the contravariant metric, really easy here. Just one over each one because there are no off-diagonal components for our orthogonal system like the cylindrical. Okay. So our Lagrangian, that's it. That's the general formula for it. And um, the uh, idea is we're going to take the uh, partial derivative with respect to each of the uh, dotted uh, coordinates that each of each velocity, partial respect to each velocity, gives us uh, the um, stuff that we looked at before when we first used uh, the polar coordinate uh, covariant contravariant formalism. So there, that's what we're after. Now remember, and this is kind of neat for something that just involves one particle, the contravariant momenta are the velocities. That's, that's kind of neat. You're something to remember. So the uh, contravariant Christoffel, uh, the second kind, they're going to be things that don't have any mass attached to them. That's worth no noting. It makes uh, things a lot simpler. So let's go for it. Uh, this is what we're dealing with, and it's going to give us this. We know that from the general formula that so whatever we get out of this, we just look at the coefficients of a particular velocity that shows up from this one and say, ah, whatever is multiplying that is the Christoffel coefficient of the first kind. That's the technique, okay, that really saves time. Don't need to look at 27 things. Um, we can get to, uh, there very quickly, okay? So I, I make note of that. Uh, right here, and then go ahead and make a few of the first ones that uh, we've actually already been through this. Okay, this goes, goes way back. <clears throat> I'm just mentioning the Christoffel coefficient formula here, but we don't, we don't need that. Uh, we can avoid that. Um, we just look at whatever we get by uh, writing out this, the garbage truck. <laughs> and um, that's what's happening. Uh, right here. So I look and I see an m rho dot dot, but I'm, I, I'm interested in products of velocities. I've got a velocity squared here, so I know that the gamma phi phi rho is just mass times the radius. Rho is the radius. Okay. So that, that just to give you a feeling for the very simplest case of getting a Christoffel coefficient uh, calculated without using the monstrous formula. Uh, that um, has all those partial uh, of g's. But remember the sequence as we go into relativity. Uh, we've got a metric. That's the, the end all and be all for something flying through space time in a gravity uh, situation. Um, and it's those, those, those metric coefficients, rate of change with coordinates that determines these Christoffels. And then these Christoffels, and that's the thing we won't get probably to, that's an advanced, advanced mechanics, uh, that's the thing that gives you the field equations of gravity. But you'll be doing that in other courses. Okay? Now the thing to notice when you do this, for example, with this particular uh, one here, where you get something uh, uh, <clears throat> that involves uh, two different velocities, okay, uh, you see a, a factor of two here, which you uh, uh, must ignore. You must just simply say a uh, rho phi is the same as phi rho. We knew that from when we first wrote these Christoffel coefficients. They're symmetric in the first two indices. Uh, so I drop the two, and the, uh, the answer is m rho uh, for the, uh, this particular Christoffel coefficient, phi rho uh, phi. Okay, so we're about halfway through uh, what we need to know for uh, these uh, equations. Now, the contravariant ones are acceleration equations. Let me finish uh, putting this stuff 
uh, on the other screen here. The uh, contravariant uh, equations of motion, these guys uh, here, mass disappears for them. This one showing the mass, the covariant ones, showing the mass, but this, this one, uh, these don't. So you end up here with just a radius and a minus sign. They had a minus sign too. Uh, here you get one over the radius, okay? And uh, there is a Christoffel coefficient that we call Coriolis, okay? And then we had uh, one up here that, that corresponded to centrifugal. So there they are. That, that's what they are for uh, this really uh, simple case of a single particle in a curvilinear coordinate system. So it's a cylindrical one. So I'm going to be asking you uh, to go ahead and do this for spherical and identify them as, as best you can uh, with the um, what you know uh, uh, for this. There's the uh, actual equations of motion uh, down below uh, there with the names that we give to them. This is the Coriolis acceleration. This is the centrifugal, okay? And where did we see this before? Um, Another hurricane. They seem to be coming quite often now. <laughs> Ooh, they're nasty. This was, this was a bad one. But remember, uh, the basic uh, equation for describing the nice cool weather we got after the rain front went by, that's just a simple uh, low pressure area uh, giving you a nice clear weather that we've been enjoying the last few days uh, after a low that went, is now over the uh, Atlantic Ocean. Okay? All right. More pictures of hurricanes. Okay, um, what I would like to uh, go ahead here real quick and, and uh, do is look at what happened with that problem that involved the, um, the and I seem to have uh, lost our tornado. Um, what what uh, gives you both the tornado, uh, that is the beautiful shape there, but also if I could just stop the thing right there, shut this off, I'd be left with something rotating more or less rigidly in the center. Okay, so that was the uh, solution uh, to this problem basically uh, without any fancy coordinate systems at all, but there's just what it really looks like. You had to integrate these tangents to get the shape. This one has got curl everywhere. The curl is constant everywhere if it is really rigid uh, motion. And um, we uh, uh, tried to make a lens uh, by doing that, by rotating epoxy. It doesn't give you optical perfection because the epoxy is a non-equilibrium uh, state. So it, never gets anything within a micron. It's more like a, a plus or minus a sixteenth of an inch, but you can use that thing for other things. We'll talk about that later. But in any case, uh, this was basic solution to that uh, particular problem. And the idea is that the, when this thing, if this thing were to be able to stop before it finished dumping the water, uh, it would settle down into a little eye here that was a parabola. So I see this is sort of connected to the problem involving sophomore physics Earth, where you have a nice curvilinear uh, uh, force law coming in, okay, and then you have a nice curve to finish it off with parabola. You see, and sort of like analogies. This is a sort of a stretch, right? Completely different thing involving rotation, uh, as opposed to uh, stuff that involves divergence. Uh, this involves curl uh, when it gets to push and shove, uh, a rigidity, so to speak, uh, in the center there, constant uh, 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 curl. Now, uh, we ought to play this. I think this is cool. Uh, I will see if I can play it on this thing where it's uh, the best viewer we have right now. Uh, this is called Girl Physics. There's two girls in here, so be aware that you can get screen time. Physics girl.
And what she's going to do is make a vortex by just running a, a plate. But that vortex is connected to another one. one of the simplest and most mesmerizing phenomena I've ever discovered. You drag a plate through the water, creating two dips on the surface. And sunlight shining through the dips will create two crisp black spots on the bottom of the pool that can persist across the length of the pool. It's the California, water, everybody has a pool. <laughs> That's an understatement. For this one, I have to get in the I know I look ridiculous, but this is not warm. Yeah, it's winter. You can see the water has dropped into the depths. The best part, I think, are the reflections you get off of the surface. Yeah, your surface is a reflection. Isn't that amazing? I couldn't see what I was filming, but this just looked so we tried two in sequence. So we made a green and a red one. The red one cut the green one in half. The red one didn't die, but the green one kind of disintegrated. It was cool. And of course it runs into my camera and dies. The vortex hit on this end of the camera, and then you can see the death of the vortex just moving along the rest of the vortex. It almost looked like it was unraveling. Which I'm hoping won't happen here. We're going to put the pool in the pool and let the vortex pass by so that the pool cuts it right in the middle. And I'm hoping that it'll meet back on the other side or it'll split into two forces. It's amazing. Not me how these things walk along. Oh, it just kills it. I think there's too much turbulence when there's an asymmetric collision of the vortex with an object in the water. Walk along the wall. This, I, this one I don't understand. This this is really quite neat. It's got dark blue here and red there. Watch them intertwine. Look at that. One of them went over the other. Isn't that amazing? We tried a smaller plate just for fun. And that's even more complicated. This is kind of cool too. I was a bit surprised by this one. I thought the ping pong ball would disturb the flow of the vortex, but it dropped right. right in and shows us how fast it's it's a constant curl. at least close to the center. Very cool. So, rigid water. Most of these vortices is really unpredictable. Very the unpredictability is what makes fluid dynamics so fun and beautiful. Thanks for all of the great ideas. Anyway, anytime you want to look at this, it's going to be fun. And there's more on the YouTube. Okay, um, now, as I say, welcome to the eyeball. Okay, this is actually Fayetteville's. Um, Free thinker uh, president uh, gave me this for Christmas. Figured I'd use it or do something with it. But in any case, it's just seven balls in a sphere. And what I want to do is figure out what they do. Okay, we've got a little video that shows them in slow motion. But the basic idea of this is effective potential. What makes it possible to analyze. Uh, this thing. So uh, once again, let's get that cylindrical, I'm sorry, spherical, um, but we're going to cut it down so that it's more like a, a cylindrical uh, a situation. Um, we have uh, <clears throat> isotropic uh, uh, potential. Uh, we're talking about um, this guy uh, right here, and we're also making a Hamiltonian expression, which is 
differentially and numerically uh, correct. Um, let's go ahead on this and get it back to uh, uh, normal here. And get the uh, equations up here as well as uh, down on the end there. So when working with um, writing this equation uh, subject to the symmetry that it tells us it has by having uh, the uh, partial derivative of this uh, Hamiltonian uh, with respect to uh, it, of an angle. There's nothing in here, of, of nothing left in here uh, but the um, radius because the z component of momentum is a constant here. So this is just our, our cylindrical um, equation being uh, written out. H has no explicit z dependence or uh, uh, phi de dependence. So we expect the derivatives with respect to the coordinates associated with that, in this case uh, z, whatever w is happening here in this particular thing, uh, the velocity uh, in the z direction could be a constant. We're going to take that to be zero uh, in uh, this uh, particular uh, exercise. So we're just going to be um, <coughs> interested in um, an equation that looks like this. I'm not going to worry about the z uh, kinetic energy at all. Just the uh, radial and then the angular very nicely summed up with the constants uh, that are associated with that. So once we've set the, uh, once we've made use of that uh, equation right there, it has to be constant because p phi, the derivative of this thing with respect to phi, uh, is absolutely identically zero. I'm left with that particular uh, momentum component we just worked out in the previous uh, look at cylindrical coordinates. So uh, let's go ahead and write everything out that we need for this problem uh, on all of these screens. We won't go and do an integral. We're not interested in uh, travel time. But we are interested in something else. We're interested in um, angular velocity, basically, uh, of two kinds. In this case, sort of a radial velocity versus an angular velocity. And uh, here's a radial velocity right here. Um, this is just Hamilton's equation, and uh, I'm getting the momentum as being the uh, answer to the rho dot, and I'm writing that uh, just using uh, the equation that sets the energy uh, a, a constant. So, um, let's go ahead and uh, look at the general case. When you have an effective potential, that's what uh, we, we've talked about this already, the uh, idea <coughs> that I take uh, just the part of this, I've killed this thing right here, so all I have left is this and this, call that an effective potential. There's an actual potential right there, and this is this thing called the um, centrifugal barrier. I mean, the basic idea of the centrifugal barrier, uh, let me back up on this one. Uh, the basic idea of centrifugal barrier is that it prevents rho from going to zero by charging infinite energy uh, for you. I can't make this thing uh, go to uh, 1 over 0 squared um, without using infinite energy. So that barrier uh, is in place and um, that, that's what we're uh, dealing with uh, with anything that's rotating. Anything that has any angular momentum is just not going to be allowed uh, uh, on the barrier and it's going to be prevented from being near the barrier. So this is what we would be writing out here in an approximation. Now, what could you get for this thing? Uh, it's possible that you could get, most likely, get something like this. It will be a stability point somewhere uh, where things orbit around it, so you get a, a, a phase uh, arrangement. But then the other possibility is that this thing is, is a, a reverse sign. That is, if this thing turns out to be a negative, then we'll have something like a saddle point for our phase space. So this, this is what you run into when you use effective potentials in the first cut, the 
and allowed going to a, a third derivatives or fourth derivatives, this is what you're going to be dealing with. Uh, and that's where most of these uh, problems stop. But uh, it's always interesting to take them a little further. In any case, uh, once you've done this, once you've uh, uh, gotten the effective potential and its properties exposed, uh, what, what, what uh, occurs is a formula for uh, the uh, frequency when you are on a stable orbit of some kind. And so you, you, you have a frequency that's associated with this spring constant that uh, results uh, from having this particular thing uh, be a constant. So this would be the this, this spring constant for something oscillating in the rho direction. Okay, So you get a frequency for that uh, right there. And that's uh, what we want to uh, evaluate. Okay, Now, <clears throat> making an orbit that's closed is tricky and doesn't happen very often. Only if there's really high symmetry, like Coulomb, outside the Earth, sophomore physics Earth, or any Earth or planet, inside the sophomore physics, uniform uh, mass, uh, that's a very high symmetry. The very high symmetry that gives you orbits that are closed like this one is. Now this one had a little dimple in it, the ones that we've been making in our uh, oscillator analysis, a nice ellipsis uh, inside the sophomore physics Earth. Meanwhile, outside the sophomore physics Earth is uh, another ellipse, and we're going to be spending time talking that, about that in Unit 5. In any case, these two are the ones that occur for the most famous physics problems involving orbits in and out of Coulomb and oscillator, respectively. So, what we're interested in for systems like this is a possibility that we might adjust the constants so that this was a rational fraction. And if it was, it would be one or more of the orbits that are listed here. Uh, say we only go up to uh, uh, indices that are uh, five or six. So this is just a table of the possible orbits that can occur uh, in a situation with an effective potential uh, in two dimensions. And uh, that is what I'd like to try to show you actually happening with the eyeball. But th that's, that's the uh, main message that I want to get across uh, uh, to Dave. And uh, what you're going to see, uh, if we're lucky, uh, just in holding it up and playing with it uh, in front of the bright lights here, or uh, doing a simulation, uh, that's something we don't really have right now. I'm thinking maybe we ought to have something like that. We're getting pretty good at writing those kind of simulations, so why not? Uh, we'll see if we can do that. But let's just consider you know, what would happen as if this ratio of the uh, oscillation in the radial direction on any one of these things, the oscillation in the radial direction, um, to the oscillation in the angular direction, that is, all the way around once, or in and out uh, once uh, in the radius. If, if those uh, ratios are 2 to 4, or 4 to 2, okay, uh, you get very different orbits for those two, as you go across the thing here. If, if the ratios are 1 to 1, or 2 to 2, or 3 to 3, then you just get the situation uh, that Coulomb gives you outside the Earth. Uh, close, uh, it happens to be elliptic, but maybe uh, you wouldn't know that at first. So, um, all these guys are really the same. But all of the other ones have, you know, different uh, sort of uh, snowflake you know, or something, I don't know what to call uh, these, th these things. There used to be a, um, a toy, another toy which I've lost, but it just had a whole bunch of gears that you would lay down. It's called a spirograph. Anybody ever mess with that? Right? And you make epicycloids uh, with it. Well, these are kind of curves that you would make, depending on how many teeth were on one gear compared to the number of teeth on the other. 
and those are always integers, so you always got a closed curve after going in, you know, maybe uh, a, a large number of, of times around. Um, but anyway, that's that's just, that's the kind of mechanics that we're dealing with here. So uh, the object here uh, that I'd like to um, show is sort of sketched out here. Start out with one to one, and then consider the case, which is what we have here, of omega rho to omega phi being just a little below one, okay, and then comes up to one, okay, if rho and phi frequencies were exactly one, okay, uh, then I would get a closed orbit like this, this, I mean, what orientation it has, that, that can be a, 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 a degree of freedom. And then, as I go above rows, I make rho faster uh, than phi, that is, I make the period uh, to go back and forth shorter than a period it takes to go around. Then what I'm going to notice is that the uh, a curve like this sort of maintains its shape, but starts to rotate. That's called precession. Precession of nodes is what is going on there. Okay, and that gets faster and faster as we approach the next integer, two. Okay, and here it's just below two. All right, uh, but it's an, it's an, a double uh, thing, uh, an ellipse sort of, uh, an, uh, an oval that goes out and back two times uh, on the perfect uh, integer case. That's periodic. This is quasi-periodic. Okay? And you're noticing that the, this one has what is, is called prograde recession of nodes. This one has retrograde. These are all astron astronomical terminology. Uh, th this one is uh, processing this way while the uh, actual thing is going the other way. The thing is going in a positive orbit like that. The precession is the other way. So it has left-hand uh, uh, orbit uh, velocity. Uh, its precession is right-hand. In this case, they're both the same. So what are we going to get here? In, in, when we work out our, our uh, ratios, what, what do we get uh, for this one? This is uh, what um, uh, we're talking, basically it's between 1 and 2 uh, when you uh, work this out. Now we've got just a, we started five minutes late so I'm going to be running a little bit uh, over here, but uh, what I want you to do is, this is what the, the problem will involve for your, um, your uh, problem is coming up this week, uh, for something that's done to do loop-de-loops in a cone, this one's doing it in a wall. So, uh, both these cases, we're going to need uh, that guy right there, which you've already uh, worked out, and uh, the Grangian and Hamiltonian form, it looks like this, and the spherical coordinates that involve the momentum in this case, the phi momentum, will be compared to the angular momentum that is theta angle. So, main polar angle of a spherical coordinate. Okay? So, I've been really nice this week in the sense that I gave you this one on the board and the other one is easier. It's cylindrical in a sense coordinate. Okay? But um, it's got that radius, so that makes it uh, interesting as well. So, th this is what we, we've got to deal with as far as the sphere goes. Uh, is that uh, Jacobian, that kinetic energy uh, right there, that's this guy, and then the azimuthal uh, momentum, partial of this kinetic energy, or the Lagrangian, um, doesn't, you don't really need to go through the Hamilton mechanics with this, but it, it helps a little bit uh, for symmetry purposes, but uh, this particular quantity is going to be a constant. So as I change theta, as I make sine theta, uh, starting out with zero and start to increase, I'm going to be making uh, the momentum uh, uh, bigger here uh, <clears throat> as, a, as a factor on the uh, angular velocity. Okay, uh, let's see if there's anything. I should probably move this screen ahead 
uh, because we can see all of the formulas without getting, running into the bottom of the, of the screen here. So basically we have an equation here, alpha times theta dot, and then uh, an effective constant here, the delta uh, being the momentum squared divided by inertia, um, rotational inertia, um, as the coefficient of this uh, inverse sine, and then we've got gravity. So that's uh, MGR cosine theta, so that's the gamma, MGR, MGR radius. Radius being constant. Okay? So that's, that's what we're playing with um, on this uh, particular thing. I'm going to leave that guy down there uh, up because uh, we need to point out the two orbits that uh, we get in this uh, situation. So looking for the equilibrium point. Okay, where is this effective potential uh, has zero slope? That is zero force, zero uh, act action to move to change it. So I set this equal to zero and get an equation that um, works out uh, fairly quickly. That is, I look at this thing uh, as a general formula, the frequency equilibrium if you're, if you're at equilibrium on a particular orbit, um, it's this double derivative that's going to let you know what that frequency is, and that's the frequency is going to vary between two and one uh, for this particular case. So here's the phi squared uh, equilibrium. So we need to compare the ratios of those two. That's the deal. Now well, a little bit of algebra uh, to get uh, the one with respect to theta. Um, leaving the constants gamma and delta uh, there. So it involves some, you know, non-trivial uh, trigonometry and algebra. But basically it comes down to a pretty simple result. It's 1 plus 3 cosine squared of whatever theta you are. Now theta down here, that's pi using a, this is the z-axis and I go theta measured off of the positive z-axis from all the way down here, that's theta equal pi. I pass the equator where theta is pi over 2. Those are going to be the two places that this thing uh, manages to uh, reach equilibrium. So that's the thing that we're going to be looking for. So th this sort of sums it up right here. Is um, You're going to uh, find uh, a ratio here starting at 2 uh, when I uh, make, uh, cos make this um, let's see if that's right uh, there. Uh, if I make the cosine zero, that's the equator, cosine pi over two makes that zero, then I have one uh, for the ratio. But if I go uh, all the way to the very bottom, if I'm just making a very uh, small orbit around the bottom of this uh, bowl, I should get something that looks like that. I should get a value of two. That's This, this is uh, the ratio squared equals 1 plus 3, that's 4. Square root of that is 2. Approaches 2 to 1. Okay? Does that make sense? So, as we go from this to this, we're going to do, be doing what's at the bottom of that screen over there. We're just going to be working our way up to the equator, and as we get to the equator, the thing uh, could, uh, you know, very closely freeze on one orbit that uh, looks like a Coulomb orbit. This is a harmonic oscillator orbit. So we're going between the two extremes of uh, motion that we've talked about in the, in the, uh, quite a bit in this class. Okay. All right, uh, let's go ahead and play the movie. I think I can do that on this uh, screen right here. Go through all the algebra again and show this and then this. Okay. Now it's really hard for me to actually demonstrate things by hand. It took me a long time to get one that even began to show what I wanted to show. Uh, uh, you can come and play with this thing as much as you want, but let's just go and look at uh, the orbits. There you see a elliptical thing sort of processing as it started out. But now, now there are orbits that are more like this. As the, as the thing drops, and that's the problem. This is a real problem. So friction is changing us from one case to the other. Okay? Do it one more time here. Now, 
what was hard here was getting only three balls going. There's seven balls we're playing with here. Okay, and I can't open this thing up without breaking it. So I'm stuck with keeping seven balls there, but I can get three going that don't run into each other. And you can kind of see that if I play the movie again and then stop it, say about there, you can see the three balls are sort of following each other and not hitting each other. Okay, that's the key. So uh, basically, if I just start this thing rotating, most of the time I get them all going. And mo most of the time they don't do collision. But I, if I try to get something like that, that that's really hard where you start, start to see it. So I'm going to let you go ahead and play with this thing as much as you want. Um, this is the, you know, basic, the best I can do uh, in a short amount of time. I'm just having three balls going. And each of them uh, starting out with something like that that has a slow procession of the a Coulomb-like ellipse, then it turns into something that's kind of a mess as it goes and changes into this. That's the deal. So um, I'm going to be asking you to do this in a cone. And that you can demonstrate, I think, if you have an apartment where you have funnels, right? You can try this out uh, much more easily than uh, this one. All right, I think that's about as much as I want to do uh, here. Uh, today, um, here's the main message: ratio is between two and one, and it's there. They are the uh, things uh, approaching uh, pi at the bottom, and uh, the equator uh, is pi over two, or the other limits. And that's that's pretty simple. Okay, um, there's the movie again. A little quieter. That there, there you actually see the crazy stuff that happened right here. Just get a couple of orbits of that, and then it's gone. Okay, we've seen this. I'm going to having you do that one uh, right now, and you'll get some help from this graph paper and some of the things that are here. But um, I'd like you to get familiar with the cycle. Okay, that's that's what you're doing right now. Okay? All right. Thank you for showing up today with <laughs> half the class. It's, uh, <laughs> um, we're in the thick of it now, but we're more than halfway through, as you can see. Um, most of the stuff that's on the extreme right is just mathematics of s s some determinants and stuff like that. So, uh, do we do like instructions? All right. Any questions or further comments? <laughs>